and verse 17, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 17. What I was talking about, I read verse 17 to you, that basically the testator has to die. Once he dies, then he can enact the operation of the testament. Yeah. So when Jesus died, it's common sense that he was able to enact the New Testament. It was put into action. It was operating. Now, what about the Old Testament then? That's the question. It's the same thing because of the blood of the animals. So because of the blood of the animals, that's the reason why the Old Testament was able to be in action, which is why, interestingly, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, how did God clothe Adam and Eve when they left the garden with animal skins? So perhaps those animals died and that enacted the Old Testament. Now, we've covered the Old Testament and New Testament. Recall that Calvinists and other theologians, they confuse Old Testaments or Testaments with covenants. So in some modern Bible translations, they won't say Testament. They'll say covenant mm -hmm. because they think they're the same. They are not the same. As I argued before to you, the, test, the difference of the covenant and the testament is that God did make covenants before, and those are covenants He made where there was no act of death. So if it was translated into covenant in Hebrews chapter 9, that a covenant is a fourth after men are dead, then it would contradict itself. Because there are several examples in your Bible where God made covenants within the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, you see five covenants here. Uh, you're going to see, excuse me, uh, it's about four. I don't know why I wrote five. Yeah, I can't even count. Okay. Then. So you will see four covenants mentioned within one Old Testament. Let me repeat that again. You will see four covenants enacted within one Old Testament. If that is the case, then why is it far-fetched to say that there could be multiple applications of a covenant within New Testament? They don't want to believe that. They don't want to believe there are multiple covenants within the New Testament. They want to insist that the New Testament is the new covenant. So there's only one covenant. But as you might recall, we Bible believers argue that this new covenant has double application it has two ways, a new covenant for Gentiles, new covenant for Jews. So notice right here, two, not one. And obviously, to those theologians, they think we're making it up or that we're trying to conveni conveniently divide things and making up our own doctrine. That's not true. The reason why is you see the same thing in the Old Testament, multiple covenants. Things that are different are not the same. Things that are different are not the same. If there are covenants that God gave to a specific person or a group of people, and the terms and the sayings of the covenant are far different with what He said to another group of people or to another person, then shouldn't those be different covenants, not the one and the same thing? So that's the problem with theologians who believe in covenant theology, covenant of grace, uh, a.k.a. they do not believe in dispensationalism. Remember, dispensationalism believes that you have to see differences in the Bible and you'll have to divide those things to different groups of people, different time periods. So what is our evidence that there are different manifestations of the covenant? So I'm going to give a little bit of an apologetics argument and then just move on. I already given some of that in our last Hebrew study, so I'll just refresh some things and then add some new things. Remember, uh, argument one is because a covenant can be made with people who are alive. Testament is enacted when people are dead. Mm -hmm. So then you're going to have contradictions when God made covenants with Abraham and with other people, but no one died. No one died. So you have to understand that. Understanding that that is how covenants operate, and they are different from testaments, the KGV translators are correct then to write the word testament, to write the word testament. Now, some people might argue and some people might insist that the Greek word in Hebrews chapter 8 
if you go to Hebrews 8, which we looked at before, and verse 7, that word covenant, which is contrasting first uh, the, the old covenant and new covenant, is the same context as Hebrews 9. And verse, um, uh, we could say, 15. Hebrews 9, 15. It's all talking about the same subject. Old covenant, new covenant, Hebrews 8. Hebrews 9, Old Testament, New Testament. So, it should be the same wording in the Greek, some people might claim and argue, that it should be covenant in Hebrews 9, not testament, because it's talking about the same thing by context. Well, the easy debunking to that argument is this. Even if you're to argue same Greek words, I don't care if it's even the same Greek word, let's even assume that it's covenant here at Hebrews 9. If it was covenant, a person can obviously tell from Hebrews 9 that that covenant is different from Hebrews 8 covenant. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Just like when God, it, here's an easy example. Just like God made a covenant with Noah, he's going to, even if that same word is used covenant with Abraham, you're going to see two different covenants. Mm -hmm. They're different. So even if they were to argue the translation should be covenant in Hebrews 9, it still don't change the fact that that Covenant is still different in Hebrews 9. So the KJV translators, they were just so much more smart than your modern Bible version translators that they just put a different English word in their testament. That's far better, testament. Besides, English-speaking people, not Greek, they always go to Greek, 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 but this is English King James. So you got to think of proper English translation, not Greek translation. So, KJV translators, isn't that common? My last will and testament, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. When it connects to death. Yep. So, that's a more proper English translation. Here's another argument. Another argument is, where in your Bible, then, are you going to have any Bible verse proof about Old Testament and New Testament? That's good. This is the, uh, this is the only uh, chapter you're going to find Old Testament, New Testament. Do you believe in Old Testament, New Testament? I don't care what theological background you are or denomination. Every church, every modern Bible version translation has Old Testament and New Testament. Why don't they change it to Old Covenant, New Covenant then? See that? So we want a biblical basis for that. Where do we get the idea of Old Testament? Where do we get the idea of New Testament? Where do we get the idea that the New Testament is the 27 books in your Bible relating to Jesus' life to the end of the millennium. Where do you get that from? Where do you get the idea that the Old Testament is from before Jesus' life to the beginning of Adam? And by the way, multiple covenants, multiple timelines going on in one testament. See that? Where's your basis for that? There is no theological system that would support it except dispensationalism, perhaps. Amen. And dispensationalism is supported through that book of Hebrews, chapter 9. Such a system is supported only in a dispensational, KJV-only setting if you argue for testament and the differences of covenants by that context. All right, understanding these arguments, let's look at different covenants that God made, if you want evidence for that. In one Old Testament, you'll notice right here. So we can argue for the same thing about two different ways of the new covenant right here. We can do the same thing. So let's look at Genesis 9. Genesis 9. The first one is Noah. Genesis 9, which is Noah. Notice what God says at verse 8, Genesis chapter 9 and verse 8. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. So notice right here that God made a covenant specifically with Noah. Brother Rob, can you share your Bible with our brother over here? Uh, oh, okay then. I see. He's got one. I didn't see that. All right then. But it's in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 8. The Bible points out right here that God made a covenant with Noah specifically. The other one, Abraham. Go to Genesis 15. Genesis chapter 15. 
Notice right here how God makes a covenant with Abraham. God also makes a covenant with Abraham. Go to Genesis chapter 15. Notice right here that at verse 1, the Bible reads here at verse 1, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Mm -hmm. And then he gives a promise about uh, the seed that will come out of him. If you look at verse 5, and he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Notice that this promise or covenant is made in verse 18. 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And that is the boundaries of the promised land right there. Okay, we're going to look at... Uh, Second uh, Samuel chapter 7, Second Samuel chapter 7. We're going to bypass Moses here. If you'll notice right here, when the author of Hebrews talks about the Old Covenant, remember that? Mm -hmm. At Hebrews chapter 8, this was, these two were discussed in Hebrews chapter 8. The Old Covenant, according to the author of Hebrews, he's focusing only on one right here. When he says Old Covenant, he's referring to the Mosaic Covenant. He's not referring to the Abrahamic Covenant or the other covenants. He's referring to Moses. Maybe there's some partial application with David as well. But David is more special. But it would be more of the Mosaic Covenant right here. So the author, when he uses Old Covenant, he's, coming, uh, he's talking about his own idea, his understanding of the Old Covenant. It wasn't some kind of specific deal or a specific name called the Old Covenant that the Lord did uh, with a certain group of people or a certain somebody. No, the author, he's, in his idea, he calls it Old Covenant, and he's just simplistically referring to the promise that God made with the children of Israel and their kingdom that could follow along. Now, the kingdom that will follow along is carried on by the new covenant for the Jews. So those Jews will get a kingdom that will last forever. That's what God made a promise with David. So David's covenant is kind of a hybrid, so to speak, perhaps. So I only say perhaps, okay, with old covenant and new covenant right here. Because God's covenant with David is that from his seed, there will be a ruler where they, he will reign. And from David's seed, there will be a kingdom where it will have no end. Now that's no doubt Israel as a restored nation at the millennial kingdom. Right here at the 1,000 year reign or millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. The Davidic throne will be carried on right here. That's the, notice right here, new covenant. See that? New covenant for, notice the group of people, Jews. So within this whole New Testament we see a new covenant as well. And the new covenant has two, which is one Gentiles and the one Jews. And the Jews cover the span from the time of Christ, notice right here, to the end, to the millennial reign. Yep. So that is referring uh, to the new covenant that God made with Jews. Notice that has zero application to the Christian church. When you look at Hebrews 8, he's talking to Jews right here. These are not replacing these. They're different groups of people. And God has a separate application of a new covenant for Gentiles as much as he gives a separate application for Jews, like I've argued to you before. Now, 2 Samuel chapter 7, notice the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. When God makes a covenant with uh, King David, he says right here, in uh, verse 8, Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over uh, my people, over Israel. Verse 10, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. See that? That sounds like Israel will never wander again. 
Why, that never happened yet, obviously. They never had their, a ruler that will have a lasting kingdom. It's in conflict right now. That's why it's called Palestinian conflict, or so-called. Mm -hmm. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. Why, that's not true yet. So that's got to be sometime in the future then, obviously, because it didn't happen yet. Look at verse... Uh, 12, and when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, obviously that kingdom is gone. So in other words, it's been postponed then. There's been a jump in the timeline, and then it'll have to carry on right here at the millennium. Notice right here in verse um, 25, 25, And now, O Lord, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish forever and do as thou hast said. Notice right here that the Lord, he made a promise, a.k.a. covenant with David. Look at verse 28. And now, O Lord, thou art that God, and thy words be true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Amen. So we see right here another covenant made with King David, and this is what we call the Davidic covenant. Let's go back. Let's go back. So when you see verses talking about the new covenant for Jews, you'll notice how the details differ from new covenant that God gives to Christians. That's why Christians came to the scene, the Christian church came to the scene because God switched from Jew to Gentiles. If a Jew wants to get saved in today, the church age, so as you might know, that this is AKA today, obviously, then he's going to have to follow the Gentiles way. He's going to have to follow the Gentiles to find salvation, find Christ. So that Jew is going to be in the Gentile system, a Christian church. But during the tribulation millennium, mm -hmm. they, the Gentiles have to go by the Jewish system. That's right. They have to go by the Jewish system. Now, when we go to Hebrews chapter 9, explaining all the arguments, defending a dispensationalist point of view, of testament versus covenants. Let's continue on in verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, meaning that the first testament did not have, uh, did not miss out the dedication of blood. There was always bloodshed throughout the Old Testament. You'll notice that right here, animal sacrifices. For when Moses had spoken every precept, to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. So Moses, he talked about every rule in the law of Moses to all the people, the Jews, and then he would take the blood of the animals, calves and goats, and then he would also take water and he would take uh, scarlet wool and then he would take what they call a hyssop. So with that hyssop that would have a lot of those uh, liquids or ingredients, he would then spray it upon the people. So he would sprinkle what? The book and the people. He would sprinkle the book and the people. Why is that? Saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. So Moses, he would tell the Jews that as he sprinkles the blood on them, that this is the blood, the animal blood that in Acts, that the Testament is able to act upon. So that Old Testament is able to operate in action because of that blood of the death of the animal, Remember, somebody or something has to die for the testament to be enacted. That's the reason why blood was so important. Shedding of blood was so important so that testament can be operating upon those Jews. That's how God was able to enjoin, stay connected to those Jews due to the blood. 
And that's why the tabernacle and all the vessels of the priesthood ministry had to be sprinkled with the blood of animals so that those earthly things that those Jews built would have God's testament enacted, operating upon them. Because remember, the blood is where they receive connection to God. So that tabernacle would have no connection to God if it didn't have the death of the testator. And remember, those animals are those testators. Verse 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Notice right here that the author says almost everything within the law of Moses, they had to be cleansed. That's what purged is. They had to be cleansed by the blood. Because without blood being shed, then there is going to be no forgiveness. No for forgiveness. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly... Uh, things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the, ar uh, the author is arguing that because it's that important to receive the blood of animals so that it can receive, those things can have a connection to God as well as forgive forgiveness. That's why it's necessary that the tabernacle, that's referring to the patterns of things in the heavens. Because remember the tabernacle, for some of you who've forgotten, uh, let me know if uh, they can't see the bottom here, okay? But remember that the tabernacle, which is uh, this tent here, and I'm just going to draw, you know, just a rough tent. But this tabernacle is a.k.a. called pattern of heaven, of things in the heaven. Because... Remember, the tabernacle is supposed to picture the things in heaven. That's why God gave specific instructions to Moses on how to build the tabernacle, because it's going to imitate some things in the heaven. It's going to represent some things in the heaven. So that's what the author means right here, that it was therefore necessary that the tabernacle, that's what he means by the patterns of things in the heaven. So it's necessary that the tabernacle uh, should be purified, should be cleansed, with the blood of animals. But the actual heavenly things, see that? That's not the pattern. The heavenly things, those things themselves have to have obviously better sacrifices. Earthly things, the tabernacle, is just a pattern of heaven, so earthly sacrifices are sufficient, but not for the heavenly. It's going to need a heavenly sacrifice. You could guess that would be obviously Jesus Christ. Verse 24, for Christ. Ah, see, the author answered it. It's because of Jesus Christ. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, meaning that Jesus Christ doesn't enter into the, uh, this place. Remember, the tabernacle has the holy place, right? The holy of holies. So Jesus Christ doesn't go to the place that is physically made. That's what made with hands is referring to. So he's not going to a place that is physically made by physical human hands because these are figures of the true heaven. These are just patterns of the real deal, which is heaven itself. Jesus Christ actually went into, the verse says, Heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So just like the high priest who's appearing in the presence of God, uh, standing for the stead of the people, the Jews, Jesus Christ does the same action as the high priest, but he does so into the actual heaven itself with the actual presence of God Amen. himself. God. Verse 25. Verse 25. Verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. Meaning that uh, Jesus Christ, uh, when he appears in the presence of God for us, he's not going to be like that high priest. Where the high priest, when he enters the holy place or in the presence of God every year, 
So I believe it's a once a year thing and he receives the blood of animals. That's what the blood of others is referring to. Yet Jesus Christ, he doesn't have to do Amen. his sacrifice again every year to stand in the presence of God. That's what the author argues, that he doesn't have to offer himself often. Verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay, there are two doctrines that I'll be covering here in this verse. First thing, the author is saying that if uh, Jesus Christ, uh, he can't do it by one sacrifice of, him, of himself, then he's going to have to suffer often. And the way he's going to suffer often is ever since the foundation of the world. So the beginning of time. But it's only once, it's only one time that Jesus Christ has to die in the end of the world. So notice right here, from the foundation, which means the beginning up to the end. What the author is trying to point out right here is that throughout all time, that's what he's trying to point out right here. Throughout all time, his one sacrifice was able to clear the deal. But if that one sacrifice can't clear the deal, then what the author is saying is that ever since the beginning of time, then he'll have to keep dying for the people in that stead of that time and then right here, right here, right here, right here, all the way to the end. So it's, it has to go right from the beginning of time all the way to the end right here then. That's what the author is trying to point out. But Jesus Christ's sacrifice and death, it's so powerful, he can just die no matter what time period he chose right here. And it'll go from, it'll cover from beginning to the end. It'll cover from beginning to end, which is why, as I've taught you in the other Hebrew study classes, which I won't cover, that's why those Old Testament saints, they couldn't go to heaven after they died. They had to go to Abraham's bosom or paradise, which was below the earth that time. All sins go below the earth. That's where hell is located. So Old Testament saints had to go to a place called paradise, which is within the lo locality of hell. And they had to stay there because that's where sins are buried. But then what, they had to wait for their Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Once he died, it covered all the beginning timeline right here. So then, hence, they can be free and go up to heaven after that. Uh, continuing on in verse 26, finishing off that interpretation. So through that one sacrifice, it was able to reach in the end of the world and he appeared that uh, one time when he came right here to put away sin through his own sacrifice that's the idea two doctrines that we're going to be covering right here the Calvinists they insist that ever since the beginning of time, or what they call the foundation of the world, that's their favorite line, all right? Foundation ever since the foundation, foundation, foundation of time. Blah, 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 blah. So the foundation of the world by Calvinists is highly prized by them. That's their favorite wording, all right? Ever since the foundation of the world, you know, you've been elected, God chose, and God realized that, okay, these will be the people that I elect to trust in the shed blood of my son and they will go to heaven. Meaning then that the unfortunate ones who are not chosen by God, then they go to hell. But that just sounds very evil, so Calvinists won't word it that way, all right? So they make a big deal about foundation of the world. God already made a decision. He already elected those where the blood of Jesus Christ's son would cover them. If you go to Revelation chapter 13. Now keep your hand at Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. <coughs> Their favorite passage is Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Chapter 13 and verse 8. Notice right here, these people go to hell because their names are not in the book of, in the book of life from the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Meaning then, it sounds like ever since the foundation of the world, 
God already realized, hey, I'm not going to put your name in the book of life. You're going to burn in hell. Well, that just sounds sad. Notice right here in verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, the easy debunking to that argument is this. Notice right here, it's the, what's written in is not written in the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's written in the book of life of the name, the name of Jesus Christ. I'm the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. That's his, that's his reference. That's his name. So what it's talking about is that their names were not written in the book of life. Okay? That's a whole idea. But even if you want to argue, the book of life, which is connected all the way from the beginning of time, so your name was not written in there, so you're doomed for hell, the easy answer to that is all of us were. All of us were not in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Duh. Until you get saved, then he puts your name in the book of life. Well, that's pretty obvious. Your name wasn't written from the foundation of the world. Okay? So that's the easy debunking to that argument. Calvinists are not smart like they try to appear they are. All you have to do, like I told you, is talk very smooth with semantics and theological terminologies, with philosophical sayings, and then you'll fool anybody. I don't like that. I like to give it to you clear as day, plain to the point, all right? I believe a smarter person is not those who use big fancy words and then a lost logic, but those who can take very wordy, lengthy logic and break it down into clear, concise points. Besides, that's the way that teachers and professors grade you for a higher grade, is something clear and concise and to the point, right. not wordiness. They will deduct your point. Right. How many PhD theologians flunk that? How many Ph.D. liberals uh, with, with uh, 20,000 Ph.D.s for all I care and scientific degrees flunked on that? How many of them? Amen. Okay. So let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, this was not something that God said, all right, so when you die on that cross, it's something from the foundation of the world where I know that, uh, where I already chose, these are the people you're going to die for. No, it's not something where Jesus Christ uh, had to die, where God elected. It's more of foreknown. God would foreknow that Jesus Christ would die. From the foundation of the world, God foreknew Jesus Christ would die on the cross. It's not that Jesus Christ died ever since from the beginning of the foundation of the world and then covered everybody. It's not, that's not how it works. Now, there are people who deny dispensational salvations. Some of them who deny dispensational salvation, meaning that there's a different salvation in every timeline there. So they insist that salvation has been the same from beginning to end by faith in Jesus Christ through his shed blood. How they argue for that is because of verses like this, which we saw before, that Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So they insist that because ever since the beginning of time, Jesus Christ's death was already applicable from the beginning of time, from the foundation of the world to the end of time. No, that's not how it works, okay? During that time, Jesus Christ did not die yet. So their salvation had to be t dependent on the blood of lambs. If you deny that, then why, could it, why did they have to do animal sacrifices then? If Jesus Christ's death was already applicable from the foundation of the world. See, why would they have to do that? That don't make sense. So what we're talking about right here is that Jesus Christ's death was something that was foreknown from the beginning of time. Look at right here. When it's talking about the lamb slain from the foundation, it's 1 Peter chapter, two verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was what? Foreordained, Foreordained before the foundation of the world. But was what? Manifest. See, he, it, it was shown up, meaning that it was never shown up, okay? Never showed up. Now, the easy debunking, here's the easier debunking. The best verse, believe it or not, to debunk all the Calvinist uh, conundrum and logic and anything that is anti-dispensational in salvation, 
believe it or not, is Hebrews. When you go back, go back to that verse, Hebrews 9, 26. The author is saying Jesus Christ would have to suffer ever since the foundation of the world. Remember that? But the author is saying he didn't. All right, it's one time. Now, I'll tell you to, uh, which religion teaches that heresy. That's the Catholic Mass. The Catholic Mass demands that Jesus Christ, that he comes down out of heaven and dies again. Now, here's the thing. Those who, are, uh, who deny dispensational salvation, and they argue that Christ's death was applicable from the beginning of time to later on, they are condoning then Catholic heresy. They are accepting Catholic heresy then. Okay, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, and then we'll look at verse 27. Verse 27. Uh, 26, excuse me. I need to carry on in verse 26. The Bible says, the author is saying, ever since uh, the foundation of the world, Jesus would have to keep dying then, but obviously that's not the case. Notice that once in the end of the world, right? So I've explained to you the interpretation for that. Meaning that Jesus Christ's death, because from the foundation, beginning of time, it will cover from beginning to end. When he died on the cross, he can cover from beginning to end right here through his action. So those who are in the end, they will be covered by his blood. Now, I've explained that in Hebrews chapter 2, or even from chapter 1 through 4. There are those who will be living in the end times right here, which is the tribulation. As they live during these end times, they're going to have to keep using the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. as a part of their salvation. Remember, their application of the blood is different from how Christians apply the blood. Continuing onwards, the other interpretation could be this way. The other interpretation, notice right here, when he died, it's in the end. You see that? When he died, it's in the end. You see that? Yeah, he, so then you wonder if, it's, if his timeline, Jesus' timeline, was called the end, and then it would reach all the way to the tribulation. Now, there are those who, who deny premillennial theology, and there are those who might be preterists, who some of them might believe in this teaching, but other theological systems, what they would teach, which is really ridiculous, is that the past 2,000 years of church history, past 2,000 years ever since Jesus died on the cross, we're living in the end times. Ridiculous. <laughs> 2,000 years long. No wonder everybody during that time, during the Dark Ages, they predicted, this is the end of the world, the apocalypse, it never happened. Then Harold Camping came out with this billboard. The end of the world is coming at May, what was it, 2010, 11, or 12? And it didn't happen. So see, the everybody, uh, Je Jehovah Witnesses, the cult of the Jehovah Witnesses, they were saying, oh, this is when the prophets are coming, the end of the world never happened. They even built a mansion for those saints to arrive. Never happened. They sold it off to a family over there, actually. So. But for years, that mansion was sitting and owned by Jehovah Witnesses. It was sitting there for over two decades, I think. Yeah, it wasn't until like, I think three years ago when I visited, they gave it away. So I was hoping that they would still hold that sign, you know, where this is for the saints. Because they, yes, they still had that sign outside. They still had those signs back then. Now, people who teach that uh, nonsense about the end lasting for the past 2,000 years and stuff like that, Notice how that is pretty similar with Jehovah Witness thinking then. So we don't want to follow that kind of a system. The easy answer to this, notice because we have to realize the new covenant, right? And don't forget the transitional timeline. Everybody forgets about the transitional timeline. So much wrong doctrine comes to the scene because they don't know about transition. Now, what's a transition? This is a no-brainer. Everyone agrees with this. Everyone agrees during the book of Acts, it was transitioning from Jew to Gentile. Everyone knew that. The Jews kept rejecting uh, the preaching of the word of God. Mm -hmm. They kept rejecting, rejecting. So then those apostles, they were slowly transitioning into more of the Gentiles. And then eventually God uh, temporarily cast off the Jews, ended that Jewish timeline, and went to the Gentiles instead. 
He turned to the Gentiles instead. So recall right here during the timeline of the books of Acts, it was transitioning from Jews to Gentiles. So think about this. If the Jews accepted their Messiah then, then notice right here that new covenant after Jesus died on the cross would have been enacted in their time. So notice right here, the church age, the Gentiles, they're a bracket in the timeline. They've just been inserted. But if you take out that bracket, notice right here, it would match well from Christ's timeline to the tribulation. You get over here. This also makes a lot of sense why Paul, during his timeline, and the apostles during their timeline, they were anticipating the Antichrist to come or the rapture to happen any moment. They were expecting it to happen in their timeline. Why? Because it can happen. In the Jewish clock, it can happen if they receive their Messiah. But because they rejected it, notice right here, then this bracket got inserted, and that's where we come across over a millennia. So uh, 1,500 years to almost 2,000 years, right here. And then the Jewish timeline, notice, it's, it was interrupted. It was interrupted by this bracket. So this Jewish timeline will continue once this bracket, the Gentile bracket, ends. That's the reason why it makes a lot of sense that this has to be out of here. Once this is out of here, then you can continue this Jewish timeline and bracket. Amen. That's why we call this the rapture. That's why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, Amen. meaning before the tribulation, before the end right here, the Gentiles will be raptured up to heaven. Then you can continue on that end timeline for the Jews. You can continue on the end timeline for the Jews. Think about it. Why did Jesus talk a lot about tribulation and end times then? Come on. See that? Because the Jews, they were able, they had a chance to experience that. They could have experienced that. But because they rejected it, that's the reason why that Jewish timeline is interrupted now. And then the Gentiles, with their church age, inserted that timeline. So in verse 26, the author, he's speaking as if he is in the end of the world then. So this is not to say that the past 2,000 years of church history, it's the end of the world, but, no, but more so it should prove that the author was anticipating during his timeline that the end could happen. And if Hebrews was written by Paul before he received the revelation of the church age, the body of Christ, or even simultaneously at that time, that Jewish doctrine, that end time doctrine, was still fresh on his mind when he's writing because he's writing to Hebrews, not to Christians. He's writing to Jews. So all this would be Jewish doctrine. That makes a lot of sense then before the church age doctrine was fully implemented by Paul. It would make a lot of sense. If we were to continue on, notice at uh, verse 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So God appointed that humankind, that they will die once. But after that, they're going to all face judgment by the Lord. Now, this is obviously not true that uh, people uh, die only once, although it is true, all right? Because there have been many exceptions in the Bible where people didn't uh, die once. We know, for example, Jesus raised people from the dead. We know in the Old Testament there were prophets who raised dead people back to life. Another one is there were people who didn't even have to face death, but they got raptured up to heaven. Elijah and Enoch. Hence we see right here that within this general rule, there's obviously exceptions. But the general rule is everybody dies once. Everybody dies once, and after that they're going to face God's judgment. If that is the case, then we could guess right here at verse 27, at verse 27, when uh, Paul is writing this, and he's saying that people are going to have to face judgment after uh, they die, think about if he was, uh, how Christians can apply this, okay? So remember the book of Hebrews, it has double applications. 
Primarily, it is tribulation Jewish. But remember, at the same time, Paul is being introduced Christian doctrine. So there are some things right here the Christians can see within that tribulation Jewish teaching. Uh, some of these things are Christian doctrine that I could use for myself. So a Christian, if he were to read Hebrews 9.27, think of it this way. That means after you die, then you immediately face the judgment seat of Christ. That is very possible. So as soon as you die, you could be at the judgment in front of Jesus Christ, and he'll be uh, judging you for everything that you've done for him, your service. So that could be a very possible explanation. A general rule, everybody dies uh, once. They don't die constantly. Hence, reincarnation is a false teaching, all right? It is a heresy. It is not true. The evidences we'll see as follows, that reincarnation is not true. Here are several passages. One is the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 11. We'll look at the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12, excuse me, chapter 12. The Word of God does not support reincarnation. If there are Eastern religious people who will try to say that reincarnation is true, notice that the Word of God contradicts their doctrine, their belief. Some people who are of Eastern religions, they'll try to assimilate their Eastern religious doctrinal beliefs with Christianity, but notice that they do not coincide. I remember this one guy at Comic-Con. I forgot what cult he was. It was some kind of weird Eastern religious cult thing. But he was trying to say how uh, Christianity is just like one different branch that comes out of many different branches out of one tree and he was trying to harmonize and I'm like saying uh, look it don't make sense uh, what, do you believe in reincarnation yes well notice right here in this verse that don't match up with that so how are you going to explain that so there was no way that he could argue against it he tried to use example after example because those guys are trained to do apologetics actually I can tell but I could tell he was just regurgitating from every different example the same thing. I said, hey, friend, I don't know if you're noticing, you're just repeating the same thing, all right? The verse says right here, you only die once. But you are insisting everybody dies multiple times, no matter what different example you pull. Now, that's the sneaky thing about scholars and some theologians and cults who go into uh, debates. What they do throughout all that jibber-jabber is re regurgitating the same nonsense. So you have, to, uh, you have to filter through that. You have to pay attention to their wordings. Don't let that throw you off guard. They want you to change the subject and topic through their different argument, different wording. See that? Because they're trying to make you... So I'm giving you a tip here in soul winning, all right, in apologetics. Through their wording, what they're trying to do through different wording, different examples throw you off from your wording, from your argument, and switch it to a different topic, different argument. That's what different words are used. Don't let that throw you off, all right? Just show them point blank, expose it for what it is. Friend, you just repeated the same thing. <laughs> okay, now anyway, 2 Samuel chapter 12, that was just a bonus. 2 Samuel chapter 12, notice what King David said. In verse 22, concerning his child who died. <clears throat> and he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Look at this. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Notice right here that David argues and believes that he's going to join the baby in the afterlife and that there's not another life where the baby's going to go through. Now, here's a stronger passage. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice immediately when you die, you're immediately present with the Lord. Immediately after you die, you're immediately present with the Lord. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says in verse 6, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, so meaning while you are still alive in your body, we are absent from the Lord. 
That means you're away from God. You're not with him. But then the opposite must be true then. If you're away from your body, you must be present with the Lord, that means. Verse 8, we are confident. So, so he's confident, I say and willing rather, to be absent from the body and to be what? Present with the Lord. Meaning then there's no reincarnation. You are immediately with God. Okay, go to Hebrews again. Return to Hebrews. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. 28. The Bible says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So Jesus Christ only gave himself as an offering one time to bear the sins of the whole world for everybody in the world. Now, some Calvinists might argue, notice right here, it didn't say all, it said many. Well, the easy answer to that is, isn't all many? <laughs> it's just that simple, all right? That's a dumb argument. All right, anyway, all means a lot of people, all right? It's many people. So let's look at, continue on in verse 20. That's not a very clever argument. Okay, so verse 28. And then uh, those who look for Christ, look for his appearing, then Jesus Christ will appear to them that second time. Because remember, his first time was right here. That's his first appearing. Then his second appearing, which a majority of Christians can agree with and know, is right here. He's coming down. That's his second and he's going to set up the kingdom for a thousand years and reign and rule over the world. So this is his second. This is his first. Notice the author says again, those who look for him in the second appearing. Yeah. Wait a minute. He's writing as if those people will live and are able to live to see that second coming. What's he doing then? He's writing to tribulation Jews. This is not Christian doctrine then. That's why Hebrews, you have to be careful. If you apply today's doctrine, the church, in the book of Hebrews, you're in a load full of trouble then. This Hebrews is covering as if it is in the end times, the tribulation. Jews, where they're going to face that. So Jesus Christ, he's going to appear to them the second time. Perfect, holy, no sin. And perfect, pure, holistic salvation. Because he's going to save the whole world itself. Creation will be saved. But during that time, he had to appear and carry sin with him. Remember that in his first one? That's why the author is arguing in his second one, it won't be like that. In the second one, it won't be like that. Okay, chapter 10, verse 1. <clears throat> For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things. Okay, that's a, that's a mouthful there. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's already a lot of stuff. So let me explain that, okay? The law of Moses, remember this is the Old Testament, the law of Moses, is a shadow. So it can only be, again, a picture, a representation of what? Good things that are coming. Now remember... Throughout chapter 9, and I think chapter 8 and chapter 7, the author constantly talked about the Old Testament and assimilated uh, it with the law of Moses, saying how it mimicked, how it represented what the heavenly things, the actual heavenly things, how the priesthood would picture the high priest, Jesus Christ, how even the animal sacrifices would picture and represent the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's what the author was talking about. The law was picturing all those good things to come. Remember in Galatians, uh, we'll look at that verse real briefly. Remember in Galatians, it was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So it matches up very well with a shadow of good things to come. It was showing that something better was on the way. It was because it was picturing those actual good things. Heaven, Jesus Christ interceding on our behalf and his sacrifice. Galatians chapter 3, <coughs> verse 24. 
Verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. See that? All right, go back. Go back to Hebrews again. Chapter 10. Now, the author is also saying that the law is a shadow of good things to come. We understand that. But it's not the very image of the things. Meaning that it is not the real image, the real uh, picture. It doesn't uh, picture the real thing. Meaning that it is not an exact assimilation, exact picture, and an exact copy. So it is not the real thing. It is not the real heaven itself. That's the translation for that. Because remember, the image of God and God's image, which is up in heaven, no man can see God and live, right? Mm -hmm. So all these things, which is the image of God, the very uh, genuine essence itself up in glory, people can't see that during the Old Testament and live. God always hid that. So he hid those three things through the law of Moses. And believe it or not, he hid those things through the lens of the book you have in your hand. So that book you hold in your hand, church, this is basically that filter to the very uh, image or the real deal of God Amen. himself. Wow. That's something very eye-opening to think about. Amen. The closest to heaven you'll see, right. look at that book. Read that book. That's the closest to heaven you'll see. Amen. And you can imagine and picture. So you just look at that book. It's that simple. When you continue on at chapter 10 and verse 1, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Meaning then that the law of Moses which had the animal sacrifices, even if they were to offer every year and every year constantly, those who came to do the animal sacrifices would not become perfect through, that, through those animal sacrifices. Verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Meaning, okay, let me explain all of this. All right, I'm about to wrap it up, but I got to show you an important doctrine right here. All right, that you would appreciate. So let me explain each and every word. Look at verse 2 through 4 and see if my explanation match up. The author is saying that if those who came to do animal sacrifices constantly, that very deed would make them perfect, then they would uh, not have stopped offering those animal sacrifices. I mean, he's arguing right here, excuse me, that wouldn't those animal sacrifices stop then? Wouldn't they cease? Because if the animal sacrifice is supposed to make them perfect, why bother constantly doing it? That means it didn't perfect them. Because he argues the reason that those who worship God, when they once received that purging, that cleansing, they would have no more conscience of sins after that. They wouldn't be bothered by it. But through those animal sacrifices, they have to have a conscience and remember their sins every year. So their conscience would constantly bother them. That's why they have to constantly offer animal sacrifices. It's not possible. It is impossible in verse 4 that those blood of those animal sacrifices can take away or clear those sins. Now, notice right here, he said that at verse 2, that, they, uh, that it didn't really purge them. But then the confusion is, when we go in verse, chapter 9, verse 22, he says that they were purged with blood. So what did he mean by that? That means this purging, which is an important doctrine that a lot of you should know, this purging or this forgiveness has double meaning here. It has double meaning. Hence, why do people doubt about double meaning with covenants then or testaments? See, this is... Very common sense throughout the Bible. When God uses a certain word, it's not going to be a one application, one meaning. You got to look at the context of the author and find out differences that are plainly pointed out there. And those differences will plainly mean then it has double meanings, double application. So purging and forgiveness has double application here. 
what he's talking about when you go to Exodus 34. This is the best explanation for it. God is speaking to Moses, and he talks about those animal sacrifices. Exodus chapter 34, verse 7. He says that when people receive, uh, excuse me, when people give animal sacrifices to God concerning their sins, they do receive forgiveness. Yeah. They do receive forgiveness, but they don't receive clearing, the actual clearing of sins. So if you look at this picture right here, notice that a person in the Old Testament is contaminated by sin. When he receives the animal sacrifice, notice that blood covers him. The blood covers him so that God, when he looks at that, see that? When God looks at that person, he doesn't see the sin because the sin is covered by the blood. However, the sin is not cleared. The blood only covered, it didn't clear it. Look at Exodus 34, verse 7. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving. See that? He does that in the Old Testament. Iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means, what? Clear. clear the guilty. Obviously, like Paul said, all are guilty. All are gone out of the way. All are sinners in the Old Testament. No one is clean and perfect. So they are not clear. But notice that the blood cleared their sins by what? Go back to Calvary. That's why the author argued from the foundation of the world to the end. That death of Jesus Christ can cover that entire timeline. So... The blood is the one of Jesus Christ that can clear the sin. During the Old Testament, however, the blood can only cover them. So that's what the author meant by being purged during the Old Testament, but not actually purged during the New Testament. We understand the meaning now? What he's saying right here is, in a sense, they do receive purging, but they don't technically receive the full purging itself, where it's thorough and it covers and clear, uh, where it covers the inward part and clears all their sins, so to speak. Does that make any sense to you? So forgiveness has, and purging has double meaning right here. It has double meaning. Meaning that when God forgives them in the sense that the blood covers them. He, he just counts it as, okay, you're clean, you're holy. That's the reason why in the Old Testament, see, people who are against dispensational salvations don't understand this. They think that, well, works don't save people, so how, why do you say that during the Old Testament they had to do good works for salvation? So yes, it did not completely save them, but in a sense, it does save them. Just like the same thing during the Old Testament, in a sense, they do receive forgiveness, but not technically the full forgiveness. Meaning what? Meaning that the Old Testament saints, they were saved, they didn't burn in hell, because they had to do good works for salvation. And God, when he looked at that, he just counted it. He counted it as, okay, I won't damn you for sin in hell. All right, because why? Combined with that blood animal sacrifice, because remember this, after they sin, I mean, after they give that animal sacrifice, what's gonna cover their sin? That's why they have to do good works, see that? So they have to just stop sinning, but that's impossible, they're gonna sin again, so they have to offer animal sacrifice again. You see that? So that's the reason why works were an important setup in the Old Testament for their salvation combined with animal sacrifices. So God, when he looks at that, he doesn't see them sin. And he says, okay, uh, I won't count it sin. I won't count it sin. Even though it's not cleared, yeah. in my eyes, I'll count it not as sin. See that? That's the doctrine called imputation. Imputation meaning that God doesn't count it as sin, but counts it as righteousness even though technically you are not righteous, all right? So that's the doctrine of imputation. That's a doctrine recovering concerning about forgiveness as well. Old Testament salvation. But the clearance of it during the New Testament, Jesus Christ died on the cross. That's why the, those who are in the church age today, their works will not count for salvation because they are putting all their trust and faith in that blood of Christ, which, see that, cleared them, exactly. which cleared them past, present, and future. So they don't have to uh, keep doing good works. You notice that? So Christians during the church age, they don't have to do, keep doing good works because that blood of Christ cleared it for them. All right, so that's the interesting stuff right over there. So the author of Hebrews, let me explain again. So he's saying that during the Old Testament that, 
uh, they didn't receive the clearing, but they received the covering. It's not until Jesus Christ died on the cross that they received the clearance. Now, if that's the case for New Testament Christians, remember, he's writing to Hebrews, those in the tribulation. So wouldn't it be logical then that Hebrews during the tribulation, all they have to do is put their faith in the blood of Christ. They don't have to do good works. Why did the author of Hebrews mention so much about works then, right? So then the easy answer, as I've told you before, is how they apply the blood of Christ. <coughs> we received the blood of Jesus Christ. We didn't apply it on ourselves. Christ applied the blood on us. But during the tribulation, they have to apply the blood of Christ on themselves. And that will be further explained in Hebrews chapter 10, actually. In Hebrews 10, I'll show you later on, in the middle of that chapter, it shows you can disgrace the blood of Christ right. with your sin, and then you could lose your salvation. So notice right here, the application is very different from us. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that uh, tonight's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers. Open our eyes more to right doctrine and the truth of your scripture. Dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.